Well, I started my YouTube channel in 2008. That means that it's been up for 10 years now. YouTube, what an amazing creation that is. To think about it, anybody in the world can produce videos, basically television content, and put it out there for the world to watch for no charge. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. I, I don't know what the future is going to be, but I think YouTube is truly remarkable. And as a learning tool, I find YouTube to be just so, so invaluable. I, I mean, it, it, it's anytime I have something that breaks, I can go find somebody on YouTube that'll say, here's how you fix the alternator. Here's how you fix the steering column. Here's how, for just about anything. So it's a, it's a very good resource. Which brings me back to my channel. When I first started the video, I had, or the, the YouTube channel, I had the goal of doing videos primarily for my clients. I had this idea, I thought, okay, now if I do videos on specific topics that relate to problems that are specific to a lot of what my clients need information on, then I, all I have to do is email them a link and they can see what it's all about. And, and it, it's a win-win for both of us. It helps my business, it helps my reputation. Um, but then uh, about five years ago, I had my first video that went viral. That was a video that uh, it was, it was a big redwood removal. And, and the difference was I took a lot of time editing that video. I put music to it. I did a lot of fast cuts, a lot of special stuff. And I, I, I spent probably four or five hours putting that video together. And it's got well over a million views. It was an exciting job. It was a fun job. It was a removal. Um, the next big one that took off was a tree job from hell. And then I've had a few other jobs. I think I have about five videos now that have exceeded a million views. I've got about five or six that are, you know, half a million or more. Lots of videos in the 100,000 range, but the majority of my videos are anywhere from 1,000 to um, eight to 10,000, with lots of them that get stuck. So I started thinking about it. I thought, why do my videos get stuck? Why is it that they're not continually growing? Why are people not seeing them? And, and, it, and I came to the conclusion that they're not the sort of thing that people pass on. Um, an exciting video, a funny video, uh, you know, girls in bikinis, cats playing pianos. People spread those all over the internet. They put them on Facebook, social media. They send them to their friends and, you know, two begets four, begets eight, begets 16, keeps going and going and going and going. Whereas my videos that are educational in, in topic about trees and tree care and diagnosing tree problems and, and uh, dissecting trees, things like that, they are important, but they're they're more specific for a limited audience. Now, most of my viewers out there, um, I've got a, I've got over twenty, almost twenty three thousand subscribers now, and I'll typically get a thousand to two thousand views on any video within a week or so. So a lot of the subscribers are not watching my videos. Uh, did they subscribe because they like that you know big removal? I, I guess so. I also do a lot of videos on woodworking and some of my woodworking projects. They're very related because a lot of the wood that I use comes from my jobs. And I, I really like milling and I like utilizing um, a, a lot of this waste wood that people take to the dump. So anyway, um, today's topic is very, very good. It's a a situation that came up this morning and I'm going to dissect part of the tree. So I, I hope you learn something from it. I hope you uh, find value in it to the point of where you pass it on. Because the only way I'm going to grow this channel is if you guys, you guys spread the word, pass it on. So please subscribe, like it, send me comments. I try to answer as many of the comments as I can. And this is a really long intro, so thanks for bearing with me. B 
big silver maple, full of life. It's kind of hard to hear it on this camera phone, but this tree is just, it's got so many birds up there. So many things are happening. And there are so many little areas where the animals are living. Little holes, little pockets, little areas. And because of the species, it's a silver maple, it's recognized that this species decays very quickly. I don't know if you can see that. Let's see if I can zoom in on that a little bit. But that little hole that you see right there is what you see throughout the tree. And there is where a limb failed, which is why I'm here. And the one up above it is totally dead. And while the tree looks full and green and nice, it's got problems. So here's the branch that fell off. Let's go take a closer look at this. All right, well, let's take a look at this branch a little bit closer and try to figure out what's going on. As I said before, these branches and this type of wood decays rather quickly. There's probably some decay inside there, but the wood doesn't look too bad. There's a pocket over there. There's a spot where there was a big cut that you cannot see the wound. I'm going to clean this up, so I'll do some dissecting. I always have fun dissecting the branches and seeing what's going on. But what's really amazing here is this. It's all hollowed out, and there's lots and lots of hollows up in the tree. Let's look at it from this perspective. It's all hollowed out inside there. There's a little bit of life all the way around, but this is a good example of what happens to a silver maple when it gets pruned. And this wasn't even a bad pruning cut. You can see that it was cut in an appropriate spot that retained the branch bark ridge, but it's still hollowed out. So even Shigo's rules about proper pruning wounds don't always equal the results on some species of trees. It's, a, it's still a good rule of thumb. You've got to make your pruning cuts proper. You've got to retain the branch collar, the branch bark ridge. But over time, certain trees, they just, uh, they just rot fast. I've worked on this tree many, many times. And I guess it's very possible to say that I'm part of the reason that this tree is starting to fall apart. But I was called out here because things were happening to this tree. The first time I was called out to this tree was 1975. And I remember this tree really well. I was fairly young. I'd only been in business for three years. I started in 1973, so two years. And I was a young man. And there was a limb right here that went straight out over the driveway. And I was called out to trim the tree. And that was an obvious choice for me because it went straight out and it was growing right down where the car's parked. So I took that off. And the woman that lives here, she came out and she was furious with me for taking off that branch. I talked with her about it and she finally, you know, settled down and realized, yeah, that was probably a, a good call, a good reason. But over the years, I've probably trimmed this tree a dozen times and taken out limbs and, and you know, there's been many times that branches have broken and I haven't been up in this tree in almost a decade. So it's reached a point where it needs it again. If this tree is going to hang in there, I've got to get some weight off of it. And you know, everywhere I look, you know, look at that hole right there. Right there, there's a big old pocket. How weak is that? What's going on out there on that end? Everywhere you look, this tree has been pruned so many times that it's falling apart. They want to keep the tree. There's an emotional attachment to it. The woman no longer lives here. She's in a nursing home, but her son now lives here. And they grew, he grew up with this tree. He loves this tree. This olive tree, I can't tell you how many times I've pruned this olive tree over the years, needs it again. 
sadly they've got a liquid amber over there that's died. We've got that on the schedule to take it down. This tree over here is mostly dead. It should come down too. But they've got that huge liquid amber in the back that's starting to break branches. So when trees start breaking branches, you've got to lighten them up. Let me make some cuts. Let's see what this looks like. So I still got a couple of old 200 T's. I love these saws. I wish they still made them. But uh, this one's getting pretty tired. It, it cut this up. So let's go back to the beginning here. Let's look at what I was showing from the very start. This is hollowed out. This all came as a result of this one cut. And it hollows way up to here. From this side, it's hollow. It's punky, but it's hollow. This is the next cut. It's also very punky and hollow. Let's see this side. It's a little bit more solid, but this is all decay all the way around here. There's decay over there. There's another wound. Let's keep going. It's a little bit more solid, but um, discolored, decayed, discolored. And here's where a branch broke on the ground. And you can see there's a wound. So this wound caused this decay, which spread all the way up to the center of this, and it's hollowing out. And I cut off this union right here, where there was a cut made over here a long time ago. It's kind of hard to read it there. It's grown up and around it. Um, probably didn't catch the cut very good, but you can see there's a big decay pocket in here. And the active tissue grew up and around it and kept the tree going. And it sprouted out in mass. So there was multiples all over the place. So the new growth that comes on these wounds often increases the amount of weight that's associated with uh, the long-term weakness. So what do I do? Well, I gotta make some decisions. I should start down low and look for any wounds down low because major limb failure is always the limb failure that can lead to, uh, shall we say, potentially catastrophic damage. So I see a pretty good sized wound right there. It's hollow, so I'm gonna assume that this is hollowing out very much like what we saw over there. There's multiples over there. So I think I'm gonna take off the biggest section of this piece, the biggest section of that piece, and just follow it all the way around, lightening it up everywhere. Uh, there's big wounds way up high. The center of the tree doesn't look as bad. It was, it was typically the branches that were pruned were the ones that were going way, way, way over the house or way over the driveway. And even this side of the tree doesn't look so bad. So you gotta, you gotta make your decisions based upon what you find. And you gotta really look hard for all the, the weaknesses and the potential weaknesses, but it's very, very important that you understand the nature of the tree that you're working with. So if this was an oak tree or an elm tree or a lot of other trees that seem to tolerate wounds better, the decisions that I make would be different. But because this is a species of tree that I know rots out quickly and becomes incredibly weak quickly, we got to do a little bit harsher pruning. It is what it is. I have to leave the tree looking as presentable as possible, but as safe as possible, with a heavy emphasis on a disclaimer to the species problems. And the client knows it and they're willing to absorb the possibilities.